I believe you're in for a great treat this afternoon. Part of our conference and part of our purpose is that um, we believe that God wants to send revival and we, we are calling for a revival that is biblical in nature and it has the characteristics of the great historical movements and awakenings. And we believe that what God has done in the past, he can do today. And so we believe that part of what we need to do is we need to educate this generation of the great movements and the great awakenings and that, that have taken place. And so a part of what we're going to be doing, or most of what we're going to be doing this afternoon, falls into that category. Before we get there, let me just say to you in our next session, in the afternoon session, we're going to have a prayer time, and um, we're going to be praying uh, in general for revival, but we're also going to be praying for a particular family. Uh, in the 1950s, there was a great move of God's Spirit in the Hebrides Islands. Uh, Mary Peckham was converted during that revival under the ministry of Duncan Campbell, and uh, Mary works, well, was through the ministry of the Faith Mission and Mary works with the Faith Mission. Her husband, Colin, was the uh, principal of the Faith Mission Bible College. And we just received word this morning that he had a heart attack and he died. Uh, Mary has had a stroke, from what we understand, and so we need to be praying for her. So we're going to spend a little time this afternoon. It's like a piece of history. Uh, and when, when I heard the story, it was, it was like a, a piece of history, our history, the great history of the moves of the Spirit of God in our world and in our countries. Uh, a, a part of that peace has gone on to be with the Lord. And so we want to pray for Mary, who's left here and in, in a very serious situation. But we have something very exciting for you today. Uh, we have a South African team. I'm going to ask you to come. Uh, Francois, Willem, Elsa, would you just come and be with us up here on the platform? I think, Francois, they said for you to take that particular mic. And if... Uh, Elsa, you and Willem will take this mic. Let me just share with you what we're going to do. We, uh, we, I was in South Africa, and next year, uh, and I learned and had the opportunity to visit uh, some of the places where Andrew Murray had ministered. And in 1860, there was a great revival that took place uh, under the ministry or uh, in, in relationship with the ministry of Andrew Murray. And uh, God moved in a mighty way. And as a result of what happened there in 1860, there are some things next year in 2010 that are going to be transpiring in, uh, in South Africa. There are some things that have been going on. There's a, a great work that God's doing there. And we felt it would be good for you to know about what God's doing. Perhaps God would inspire vision for some of us through what, what is going on right now and also through uh, the history of what has transpired there. And so I'm going to start off with Francois. And, and just ask Francois if you would just tell us a little bit about what is happening right now in 2010 in commemoration of the 1860 revival and, and the heart cry for revival that you have for South Africa, and then we'll, we'll go from there. So, Francois, why don't you start? Can I just maybe say a few words about what is happening in Holland at the moment, and at the same time also in places like Malawi? I remember when I was uh, asked to do a conference on prayer and revival in Holland, a few years ago, there were only about 35 people attending, mostly from the hyper-Calvinist background people, way up north in, in Holland. And, um, and they are so strict and legal, legalistic kind of way that when, when they look at you and you, you wear a pair of jeans, for instance, you are considered to be a backsliding pastor. And um, so I arrived with a pair of jeans and a T-shirt when I, when I came to Holland the first time. And I, uh, and I thought they'll never invite me back to Holland again. But we had a second conference, and there was about 120 people or so. And then we shared the dream with them that we have for a heart cry, even for Holland as well. And to make a long story short, and in the meantime, we have opened an office in Holland. We have a, a very high-tech website running at the moment. We have several thousand people linked to that through Holland and Germany and France at the moment. And uh, we have four conferences every year that has grown from 35. There's 1,000 people attending every conference from a Thursday night through to a Sunday night. They don't drive on a Sunday, so they leave on Monday morning between 3 o'clock and 6 o'clock and onwards. And, and I was just there before I came here, and it's just amazing to see what God is doing amongst the young people between the ages of 15 and 35 years old. And I remember one time when I was asked to do a meeting, Sammy, at one of those people, and one of the guys came to pick me up, and when I looked at them, I said, man, this is going to be a long two days with this guy. 
Because he's got his whole hair was just full of gel and spiky, just standing like this, and he's got studs in various ears and noses, you know. And I thought, and because he's an older man, he's about 50, he's just oh, about wait, your wait, age, wait. I would say. <laughs> and, um, yeah. <laughs> so you c you'll, you'll look great with a stud in the nose, I would say. But so I look at this guy and I said to myself, man, for the next two days in a hyper Calvinist sitting like this. And uh, so I came to his home and uh, we had a meal together. And just after the meal, he just opened a drawer underneath the table and took out a Bible, read a chapter from the Bible, then asked us to pray for ourselves alone and just in quietness. I thought that was strange. And then we came back for the evening meal and the ne next morning for breakfast. So three times a day they read the scriptures, a chapter apiece. And then you pray. And when I saw what's happening in Holland at the moment, with, with this foundation, this background of knowing the scriptures, and God is just putting together intimacy and, and bring new life into the life of people and to get them saved and born again. And suddenly there's an explosion. From 35 people, we are a group of about 5,000 people at the moment in Holland. And I challenged them when I was there that they mustn't stop dreaming because we can see 50,000 people coming together all over Holland at the moment, and they, and they really understand that vision. And one of the, the, the sidekicks of that was especially that we started um, what you call a hard cry mentor group for pastors in Holland. And at first meeting, there was about 25 of us together for two and a half hours, just talking about our dreams for Holland and how to help the people from that setting. So I think God is doing something tremendous in Holland at the moment, and we probably will see uh, what is going to happen in the future as a result of that as well. Not just in Holland, but spilling over into other countries of, of Europe as well. But, uh, but for us in South Africa, it's an exciting time. Next year is the 150-year anniversary of the Andrew Murray revival, the 1860 revival when God came down as part of the, three, the, three, the third great awakening all over the world. And, and I remember when God started to stir my heart to pray about... Um, putting something together for next year. He gave this, this, this vision in my heart and this, this longing for, according to Psalm 85, that God will, those places where he touched in 1860 with revival, that he will send revival to those places again. And if you look at the history of revival, you find there's about 40 different towns that were struck with revival at the same time, just following Worcester and Montague and the Dwarings and those places. And and as we start to, to send out the invitations and things develop for next year, it's just amazing to see how churches is responding from all over South Africa at the moment to be part of the Heart Cry Conference for next year. So what we're going to do is we're going to have two things. We're going to have, first of all, we're going to have two conferences about revival. One will take place in the Andrew Murray Church in Booster itself on the, on the Thursday through to the Saturday. And then we have a follow-up conference at the, with the same speakers the next weekend in, in Woodlands in the, in Morleta, the big auditorium in Pretoria. But in between, there will be revivals taking place from Sunday morning through to Thursday night. We'll be preaching and put speakers in different churches all over South Africa. And, and so far, just in Pretoria and Johannesburg, more than 55 churches have responded to have a speaker at the same time, just before and after the conference in Woodland. So we'll be reaching thousands of people. And some of those churches are mega churches for next year. But the exciting thing for me is down in Wooster. Just before I came, there was an inquiry in the town already about people asking, what is all these pink little lints against the trees and the t uh, you know, the, the poles next to the street? And, and then they, le they left their little pink lints for a while in the streets. And then after two or three weeks, they start to answer the questions in the local newspaper. But this is to commemorate Andrew Murray's revival for next year. So the excitement is growing in the town <coughs> at the moment. And, um, and Coca-Cola, which you probably know in America as well, because that's a well-named biblical name all over the world, that's Coca-Cola, um, has decided to sponsor a youth rally this Saturday afternoon to pack out that whole plain area before the, before the Wooster Church. And then the evening we will have a, a special setting with, um, with a guy called Angus Buckham to do a, a closing session for us. But the message will be about passing the baton. In other words, for people to take the fire that as God has ignited into their hearts, uh, um, into their local churches all over South Africa. And so when the conference will be starting on the Thursday, we will light a special heart that will be designed as a burning heart. It will run throughout the whole, the next two or three days just burning. And then there's a something special being arranged that we will, somebody will leave with a train all the way from Cape Town to take this flame up to Pretoria. We do the same conference in Pretoria and then we will pass the baton again for all the local pastors coming together in Pretoria and for the next few days that they will take this fire to the local churches all over, over South Africa at the moment and with a specific message which we will speak about this afternoon. So the excitement is growing 
We are going to look forward to a great time next year, two conferences, several revivals taking place on Sunday through to Wednesday in local churches, running for about four weeks. So we anticipate a great move next year in South Africa, and that's what we plan. Uh, Francois, now, can people from here participate in this? They can. Tell us quickly how they can do that. Um, well, the, the easy thing always is to, uh, to pray and give money, but that's not what we want. Um, <laughs> in Cape Town, for instance, uh, uh, we have a guy that is working with Coca-Cola <coughs> at the moment as a, as, a, as a contact in the school system, for instance, in, in Cape Town. And they have signed a deal with us for next year, opening more than 200 schools for us in the Western Cape area. Um, I know schools that aren't, might sound strange for you in America, but I mean, you might think come to preach in, a, in South Africa in a local church from Sunday through to Wednesday, a revival meeting. But y if you can go to schools every day and you can speak for an hour to the young people getting together, a thousand kids and two thousand kids in some of the main schools in Cape Town, that's probably what what we are looking forward to. So in that case, we can reach more than 200 schools for next year. So we are looking for people uh, to participate in coming to South Africa next year and, uh, and to join us, not just in preaching in local churches from Sunday through to Wednesday, but to become part of the team that we would need to put them in local schools in the morning and prisons in the afternoon and in nurseries and old age homes as well, but doing two or three schools every day per person. And that way we can reach so much more schools. So we are looking for people to come from the States to help us preach in the local areas, the black communities, the white communities. And some will be preaching as well in the evenings in local churches and in the Cape Town area. Hey, thank you. The, uh, so if, if you're interested in being a part of this, let me encourage you to talk to Francois. Pull him aside sometime uh, before we conclude these meetings and, and let him know that you're interested in being a part of that. Elsa, I know that... Um, uh, I've heard so much about the Esther movement and what the Lord is doing there. Why don't you explain to us what's happening with that? The Esther conference started in 2007. And at that stage, God showed us as women that we must come to a place where we lift up the men of the country and call on them to take the spiritual leading role in their families. I don't know whether this is the same in the USA, but in South Africa we have um, many women who take, took up that specific role in their houses. And the men uh, are working very late, long hours. They don't see their children often. And um, God showed us that he will change the country if the men of the country is um, in a position where they um, take responsibility for their homes and for their relationships. So what we did is we asked of the women to, to come and um, lift up their husbands. And um, they came in the thousands, and um, we, we prayed, and we asked of God to change our hearts, and to change our country, and to make South Africa a place where we will live in the freedom of God's presence. And as from then on, we had a Easter conference every year, where um, women would come in the thousands, and as from the year thereafter, um, the men also started with the Daniel conferences, and uh, Willem will tell you more about that. So as you heard, um, one of the outcomes of the Esther conference or Esther movement, we held in 2008 the Daniel conference, and about three and a half thousand men pitched up there, and it was a excellent and a wonderful moving of God's hand. Many men, as you can see, we pray together. We bow before the Lord. We worship the Lord. And in, 19, and, and, and in uh, 2009, there were about um, between five to six and a half thousand men. But in the meantime, God raised up a man uh, called Angus Buchan, Maybe you have seen the DVD, Faith Like Potatoes. He's the man. He always say, they call him the rainmaker, and then he say, he's not the rainmaker, but he's the rainmaker's son. Mm. 
So Angus started seven years ago. He started with a conference on his farm where the miracle was. And I think the first year there was about 65 to 75 people. The next year there was over 500 people. And uh, the next year there was 5,000 people. And um, I was praying when I was a pastor on the countryside. I was praying for 14 years and say, Lord, um, do it in my time. Do it again. And Lord, I want to see it. When I go, in, when I go Sunday morning to, to church, I want to see it in the, on the front page of the newspaper that the revival is here in South Africa. And that morning, last year, there were 60,000 people gathered on his farm. And that morning I was preaching in our congregation and I went to church and uh, I see along the road on the, on the poles in the, on the front page, 60,000 men bow before God. Mm -hmm. And we were so pleased to the Lord. And this year, I was, I was this year there, and this year you can see on the photo here, um, there were 200,000 men so the Lord is working. The Lord is working. The Lord is moving uh, through the men in South Africa. And those men are going, they, they went back to their homes. They repent to their, women, to their wives. They repent to their children. And um, Angus that morning, it was a Saturday morning, he poured out his heart for revival in South Africa. And just after the service, he collapsed. And then he had a heart attack. And we saw, as we bowed down before the Lord, we saw they took him with a helicopter. And four hours after that, they brought him back. And he, the, the next morning, he testified. In fact, when he, when he moved on, on, on the stage, he was crying for about 15 to 20 minutes. While we are clapping and seeking the Lord, he was only standing like this. And he called uh, up the doctor who was looking after him yesterday, the previous afternoon. And um, the doctor testified that he had a heart attack, but God saved him. And he is he's still alive, he's still going strong. And then the last thing on the movement in South Africa is last year on a rugby stadium. You know, we South Africans, we're backing the Springboks. Do you know the rugby team? We call it Springboks in South Africa. And on a big, big rugby stadium, um, Angus was preaching and 72,000 people uh, gathered and seeking the Lord's face and worshiping the Lord. So we want to encourage you this afternoon. Is The Lord is moving in South Africa and we are praying that the Lord will move not even in South Africa but throughout Africa and the Middle East to his namesake. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I, I know that uh, this kind of move of the Spirit of God, I know that we have here people from Romania, from Sudan, different places where the Lord has moved. And, and one of the things that is in my heart is I, I believe that uh, we have a history where the seeds of revival have been planted. And those seeds take root, and sometimes it looks desolate. But if we can go back and water those seeds, uh, the Lord will do great and mighty things. So I want to talk about the seeds for just a little while. I'll let you guys talk about the seed that was planted in 1860. You're, we're going to be talking about the 150th anniversary of, of that revival. Tell us, first of all, a little bit about Andrew Murray. I know that he was a part. How many of you have read some of Andrew Murray's books? Almost everyone here has read uh, Andrew Murray. Tell us a little about Andrew Murray. Uh, he was of Scottish descent. How in the world did he end up in South Africa uh, working among Afrikaans-speaking people? So how, how did that happen? Can one of you give us some information on that? He took the boat from Scotland to Africa. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, no, his, his, his father was a pastor, Sammy, in, uh, in South Africa, uh, in a place called Grahamstown. And, and since uh, they're living in a, a very difficult time in, in Africa with the school systems, education, when Andrew and his brother John was, was growing up, they were sent to Scotland to, to finish their school in, in boarding school and then to study theology as well with the purpose of coming back, becoming pastors and helping the local church in South Africa. 
And then after studying in Scotland for some years in Aberdeen, they moved over to a place called Utrecht in Holland, spent there for three years. And then they were sent back to South Africa. And then John was placed in a different place to preach as a pastor in the Cape Town area in Paul. And then uh, I think Andrew was eventually sent as a missionary down to a place called Bloemfontein and then traveling around the northern Transvaal area from South Africa. And then so that's why th they end up. But, but you speak about the seed, Sammy, and I, as you were talking, I was just thinking about something uh, from the life of Andrew Murray. And, and I think most of us who are here this afternoon that is here because there's some sort of connection with revival because of some stories that we've read and that God's used to stir our hearts and and create this longing for God to do this again, just like, just like Willem just shared now. And, and I think if you look at Andrew Murray's life, uh, there, there were a couple of things that sort of stir the same thing mm -hmm. in his own life. The one was his, his father. And um, if you read the biographies of Andrew Murray, you'll, you'll, you'll find that, that every Friday night his father, for instance, withdraw himself for the whole night and, and spend that whole evening in prayer, praying for revival. And Andrew Murray was standing outside with his brother John, just listening how his father was crying to God for revival and for the touch and how he read the stories of revival. But then when Andrew came to Aberdeen, something happened in Scotland. And I, and, and I think that's, that's the nice thing of God has a way of putting seeds together and, and has a line of working. Like, for instance, the people that influenced Andrew Murray the most was a guy called Thomas Chalmers, a Scottish preacher. Uh, most of his, his styling of preaching was also the same way as, uh, as Chalmers, for instance. But there was another guy, William Burns, which we all know, that God used in the Dundee revival and also the Kilsif revival, the one that was preaching mm -hmm. in the church of Robert Murray McKayan, and, uh, and how he went to China eventually and, and was helping Hudson Taylor as well. So that was some of his mentors when he was in Scotland in that time. And even when they, when they moved over to, to Holland, there was, there was a few things where people were brought together, like John, for instance, and Andrew, and how they prayed together. Uh, it was called what they called the Chocolate Club, and how they talk about you know, theology and talk about God moving and talking about spiritual things. And then they would pray, they would break and have some coffee and tea and cool rings and then chocolates. Um, so they, they became the Chocolate Club. So there was a couple of things in Andrew Murray's life. And in that time, God started to stir his heart to go back to South Africa and that to preach this message of revival and that God would change the church in the nation as well. So would you say that th there were some people around him in Scotland that um, perhaps had that passion that he saw in them? And, and of course, he had a, a great heritage of his father, just hearing his father cry out, yeah. right? you know, th which is encouraging to me. I mean, we may cry out for revival Perhaps we won't see it, but maybe our children will <laughs> and uh, if, they, if they've seen us. Uh, that's really encouraging. Uh, did you want to share something, Elsa? Yes, please, um, Sammy. Many of us might not know, but when the revival started that night in Worcester, um, Andrew Murray was preaching in another town. And it, it started in the um, youth part of this, uh, of this congregation where the young people were uh, praying. And the young colored uh, girl stood up and she started praying and repenting. And as she prayed, the Holy Spirit manifested himself upon that group of young people. And as Andrew Murray rode in with his um, horse late that night he couldn't understand while the lights were still on in the youth hall so he went there and discovered the young people still crying out to God and so many times the seeds that God put together are the prayers of the unknown mm -hmm. the people that won't stand in leader positions after God has moved but that's actually the cries and the tears and the intercession of those who, who caused God's hand to move upon a country. And what actually happened was in the beginning, Andrew Murray didn't recognize that this was the revival. His father had to come all the way on his horse. And it took him days before he got there. And he was standing there in the door and he recognized God's move upon Andrew Murray's people and the congregation. And he said to his son, my son, this is revival. Hmm. Because he could recognize it as from a heart that prayed 
for revival all those years. And I just thought maybe this will also encourage you to know that so many times God moves not because of how good we are educated or the wonderful things we did for him, but just a pure heart like this girl crying out to God and revival came. Maybe I could ask you, get a little clarification so that maybe the impact of what you mean when you say that it was not the, you know, it was just the little nobody type person that God used. In South Africa, there has been and is a designation racially, if I'm not mistaken. There are whites, there are Africans, and there are coloreds as well as Indians. And the coloreds are mixed race, is that correct? And, and, and at that time certainly did not have the same kind of place in society and culture that the whites would have had. Is, is, am, am I correct? And so it was a colored girl uh, that, that was the one that cried out to God and that God really was maybe the instrument. Am, am I saying that correctly or give some comment on that? I, I, would like, I would like us to come back to the seat again, but before, we, but before we do so, I think what you're saying, Sammy, is right, but I think you need to understand the background from that time. It's not just because of a racial thing between the colors and the blacks and the white people. It, it, was, it was part of the slave trade in that time. Um, they were still having slaves, uh, which basically was the colored people and the black people from the Western Cape area serving in the homes of, let's say, the more richer white people or even some of the more richer other colored people as well. Like, for instance, in the Murray home, when you, um, when you would visit Andrew Murray's father and his, his mother and even eventually Andrew Murray's life itself, you would find that when you, when you go to their home, according to the history, that if there is a colored person working inside the home, before you will be allowed to come inside the home, he will pray for you and he will release you and set you free and said, you're not a slave anymore. In my home, you are welcome. So I think in the background of Andrew Murray, uh, growing up in the Cape Town area with the slave trade from that time, very much like America, I would say, in this time, um, that, that was the background. And not just a racial issue. It was a, it was a slave issue. Uh, and, and the Murrays start to, to sort of promote the fact that you need to be released and to be set free. And, and just you, you are a human being. And when you come to my place, you are you are free kind of thing. So I don't think it was an issue for him when he spoke against the colored girl at, at the prayer meeting. It might be for many people that she was there was the issue, but not the fact that she was yeah. speaking because his background was, he, he was yeah, a No, I wasn't, I wasn't yeah. suggesting that. I was just saying that yeah. she came from a yeah. background that was yeah. not perhaps as yeah. the same kind of... But, uh, you, but you know, the same thing happened in 1929 uh, in the revival in a place called Storms, Storms Flay, not far away from the Dastorp, one of those places that were struck with revival. And... And, and I mean, just surrounding Stormfly, there's this huge, let, let's say, I don't want to say the word synagogue, but the church that was built just following the 1860 revival in Bredasdorp, Svelendam. Um, but God chose again to, to start the revival in 1929 in a place called Stormfly. And, and again, in a small hall, and the people standing up was a small colored girl asking if she could also announce a sing, you know, hymn to be sung. And then if she could pray a prayer for revival too, and in that moment it happens again. Mm -hmm. So I think it was the whole issue of, of um, uh, uh, I, I want to say it was a racial issue alone, but I, I think it was a question of from the background, from the slave trade, just spilling over the whole time and, and going through the motions in order to come to the point of just releasing that even in the, in the Western Cape area. Mm -hmm. But it's just amazing that God used it every time to, to start the stirring just from a small little girl. Okay. Did you just want to, just to add on, Sammy, where the revival began, the parents of the 15-year-old girl, they were slaves at one of the farms in the surrounding areas. So, and um, the associate of Dr. Murray, he was Reverend J.C. De Vries. And um, she, was, she, was, she stood up and asked if she can always also present her, her favorite song, favorite hymn. And he was thinking twice. So it was a type of a racial issue. But um, according to the circumstances that night, he said, yes, go on. So and then she began to sing her hymn. And after that, she, she prayed. And it was like a noise like thunder who came nearer and nearer, closer and closer. It was a deafening sound. Uh, and as it was, the, the building was shaken. Mm -hmm. And all of the 
of the little people, of the children, 30 of them, were on their faces and, uh, and plead with God and uh, prayed loud, out loud. So th- this was not custom in the Dutch Reformed Church, mm-hmm. as yeah. not today. Yeah. So it was in Murray's side, it was a ca- type of chaos. Mm-hmm. And interesting, Sammy, is that uh, American lady, she stood up b- because Andrew Murray uh, didn't know it was revival, so he wanted to stop it. So he got up, uh, up and down the pew and said, I'm the pastor, you're calling me to this congregation. <laughs> um, cool down. And uh, the American lady, she stood up and said to him, I'm coming just now from America, and I saw this in America. This is revival. Mm. 